Welcome everyone to the June 6th program of the City Club of Eugene. Our topic today is the future of Tracktown, USA. I'm Marlene Nesri, the new City Club president for 2014 and 15. And here's a quick awesome fact about this organization. The City Club of Eugene produces about 45 original programs every year. That's 45 debates, performances, panels, and presentations on all kinds of issues that shape our life together. I'm honored to be part of it, and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you as well to KLCC Radio for airing City Club programs at 6.30 p.m. on Monday nights and for archiving the broadcasts on their site. Our sponsors today are Sacred Earth Botanicals, Marilyn Milney Public Relations Services, and KLCC Radio. A special thank you to KPFF Consulting Engineers for our office space. Welcome to new members, Mark Combe and Karen Hyatt. Joel Corrin coordinated today's program, and John DeWinter has offered to introduce the topic and the speakers. John? Thank you, Marlene. Today's program is about pursuing and achieving excellence in the sports of track and field. It's about creating a facility, Hayward Field, that is world class, the world's governing body for these sports, the International Association of Athletics and Federations, or the IAAF, has certified only four other facilities in the United States to be of comparable quality as Hayward Field. The program today also is about attracting premier national and international events and athletes to that facility. This summer alone, Hayward Field has hosted or will host the Prefontaine Classic, the National College Athletic Associations, or the NCAA's, Division I Track and Field Championships, and the IAAF's World Junior Championships. Hosting events like these puts Eugene in the company of cities such as Paris, Barcelona, Rome, Beijing, and New York City. Further, this program is about ensuring that the athletes, the coaches, and the fans who come to these events experience a supportive environment. In this regard, hundreds of track-savvy volunteers in our community provide such an environment, thereby contributing to the success of the events. Our speakers today, Vin Lanana and Michael Riley, have been instrumental in achieving the excellence I've just described. Vin and Michael are the President and Chief Executive Officer, respectively, of Tracktown USA, a nonprofit organization headquartered in Eugene. Besides being President of Tracktown, Vin is an Associate Athletic Director for Olympic Development at the University of Oregon. From 2005, when he first came to the university, to the summer of 2012, Vin served as the university's head coach of men's and women track and field and cross country programs. Before coming to the U of O, he served in similar positions at Oberlin College, Stanford University, and Dartmouth College. Through his college coaching career, Vin has led teams to 11 NCAA titles and 42 conference crowns, with nearly 60 athletes under his guidance earning NCAA individual titles. He has been named the NCAA Men's Cross Country Coach of the Year six times. In 2011, he was head coach of the U.S. men's team at the IAAF World Championships in South Korea. And he was inducted into the U.S. Track and Field Cross Country Coaches Hall of Fame in 2012. Michael Riley graduated from Stanford University in 1993. While at Stanford, he ran both track and cross country. In his last year of eligibility, Vin Lanana arrived at Stanford, and upon Michael's graduation, the two of them began a 20-some year working relationship. While remaining at Stanford, Michael served at times as Director of Operations and as an assistant coach 
in the track and field and cross country programs. He then accompanied Vin to Oberlin and to the University of Oregon, holding management positions in the athletic departments of those institutions, focusing upon track and field and cross country administration. During the same time he was working at these institutions, Michael honed his managerial skills as the competition director for four USA track and field championships, the 2008 Olympic trials, and the 2010 NCAA track and field championships. Michael left the University of Oregon and Eugene in August 2011 for one, for one of the few good reasons for leaving this area. He went to London to join the London 2012 Organizing Committee where he oversaw operational planning for seven training venues for the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games. In November 2012, he returned to Eugene to become the CEO of Tracktown. The title of today's program is The Future of Tracktown USA. Please welcome Ben Lanana and Mike Riley. Good afternoon and, um, and thank you to the, to the City Club of Eugene for inviting us here today. And our hope is to make a few comments regarding not only the future of Track 10 USA, but to talk a little bit more specifically about some of the things that have been accomplished thus far, far by this community. Tracktown is, a, is an organization that coordinates the efforts of the major track and field players like the Oregon Track Club, the local organizing committee, Nike, U of O, and the youth programs to ensure that we capitalize on all of those opportunities. Tracktown USA was established as a 501c3 in February of 2013. We have a simple vision in our organization, and that is to look at and create state-of-the-art facility, world-class events, and partnerships with the academic community. And that's what, our, that's what our mission is, is to work on a collaboration between all the different entities that are, that are part of this great community. For instance, we, are, uh, we welcome the world to Eugene with the IAAF World Championships. We have an opportunity for everyone to participate in our Run Track Town Weekend and Eugene Marathon that will be coming up this July. We've, co we've collaborated with the City of Eugene, working with Ethan Nelson on sustainability and achieving evergreen status with the Council for Responsible Sport. Evergreen level is, is actually the highest achievement within the council certification system. We have to achieve evergreen, an event needs to earn over 90% of the available credits. The IAAF 2014 World Junior Championship will become only the fourth event to earn this evergreen, evergreen certification. And this will be the, and this will be the first, first event to have a multi-day, to achieve that on a multi-day event. Um, the high points for Oregon 14 are as follows. And Oregon 14 is the World Junior Championship. Targeting 100% of a carbon neutral event. Road to zero waste, targeting 75% 75, 75 material recovery. Enhanced access to, for youth and youth engagement activities. Healthy foods, increasing the purchase availability of local and organic foods for host events providing free bus, bus service for athletes, fans, and volunteers, free, free bicycle valet parking at Hayward, partnering with the Council, IAAF, and the City of Eugene to implement IAAF Athletics for a, a Better World program. This program, the IAAF has a program established this year, and this, they will be launching it here in Eugene, and that will be IAAF Athletics for a Better World. They are, their focus is on the environment, on social inclusion, and peace. Small topics. But I do think that we are in a great position to collaborate not only with the IAAF, but the University of Oregon, with the President, the Department of Global Studies, the Deans and Departments, the Athletic Department, and the Bowerman Sports Clinic, which will be put, putting on a symposium for us. This is not just about athletics, it's about other, all the other cool things that happen in this community. And our hope is that we can coordinate and collaborate with all those activities. As you all know, the NCAA championships will be here 
uh, in one week, actually less than a week, in three days from now. And the men's and women's track and field team comes off of an indoor NCAA titles for men and women, the Pac-12 championships for the, for the sixth straight time for the women and for the eighth straight time for the men. So the NCAA is next week, beginning on Wednesday, for the first time since 1984 and 1985, both teams will have be contenders for the NCAA title. As I stand here today, the rankings bear that out. Track and Field News, which is generally the journalistic group that evaluates all of track and field, uh, picks the University of Oregon to win both. It would be historic for this community. The, what our long-term goal is, now we have that the NCAAs will be here from 2000, and it was here 13, it'll be here this year, and we will host it in this community through the year 2021. Just two days ago, the NCAA signed a long-term agreement with, soft, with the soft, sport of softball to host the College World Series till the year 2035. Now, well, our hope is to take that same model that baseball has to Omaha and now softball has in Oklahoma City and have the NCAAs here in this community through at least 2035. So we've often talked about this year being the biggest year ever. And the signature event that I came to speak about today is the IAAF World Junior Championship. It's a week-long pack with multiple and exciting fun events, including the Eugene Marathon on July 27th, the Run Track Town weekend, which will happen on the 26th. It'll have all elements of high-end competition, including the Junior Championships next to last day, which are all finals, a high performance meet, an all comers meet, and a health and fitness expo. We have a, a, a great event in the run, jump, and throw event, which will include the entire community all focused on youth events. So the IAAF championships, let's talk a little bit about that. July 22nd through the 27th. Why it's important to this, this community is that there will be 1,600 athletes representing 178 of the 212 eligible schools. It is the largest, it is the largest global event that the IAAF has ever hosted in the United States. And as a matter of fact, it's the only time that this event has been held in the United States. It's coming off of 2012 championships, which was held in Barcelona. So it's pretty good company for us to be in. Some of the other really great things about the World Juniors is we do have the, the IAAF Council has decided to come here. So that means every single person. These, this is the committee that determines where the Olympic Games is held for the sport of track and field. And we have an opportunity here to have the entire council, including Seb Coe, so those of you who are track fans probably know who Seb Coe, Olympic gold medalist and world record holder at 800 meters, and Sergei Bubka, the pole vaulter, who certainly did some pretty great things at Hayward Field itself. So we have that opportunity, and the World Junior Championship this year will have 178 countries represented, and if you wander down to Hayward Field, you will see the flags of all those countries displayed right now. And the first, and the first, time, the first time that that first event concludes, and they play the national anthem of the young man or young woman that wins the first event, I think everybody will realize just how important these IAAF Junior Championships are. This commercial that we're going to show you here is the commercial that has been aired throughout the world. This is not just the one held in Eugene or in Portland. But this has been this has been played throughout the world multiple times. Much I don't know how much publicity for at the international level would actually cost, but I think that if we this this is probably more this is probably worth way more than we could afford to pay, and it's a great it's a great collaboration that we've had with the IAAF. And speaking of collaboration, we've had a great a great partnership with the University of Oregon. We've undertaken a bunch of different 
initiatives, and let me share just a couple of them with you. The, uh, the Office of Global, uh, our, our international studies group, has put together an ambassadors program. Every single country that will be represented here in the, uh, in the U.S. and in Eugene will be led by an ambassador, which are students from the University of Oregon. Not athletes, but just students. And we asked them to uh, provide for us about 100. We had 320 volunteers in the first 15 minutes. We've selected 140 of them, 40 more. And let me share that. And so that'll be one, a one aspect that we'll cover, we'll cover this year, and every single one of them will be in place. The International Sports Science Clinic. This symposium will take place at the University of Oregon. It's an academic conference that's led by our human physiology department. That will be our kickoff event. In addition to that, we asked the, we asked the uh, architecture department to put together a flag program to display the 212 countries, which is now 178 countries, and you'll see that down at Hayward Field now. The, all of the great success that we've had here in Eugene is not just a University of Oregon or Eugene-centric event. We've been able to take the success we've had with the 2008 Olympic team trials, with the 2012 Olympic team trials, with the NCAAs, with the U.S. Nationals, the Prefontaine Classic, and we've taken it not just in Eugene, but we brought it up to Portland. And up in Portland, we will host the 2016 IAAF World Championships. It's pretty exciting since this will be the first time since 1987 that the United States has hosted this. In addition to that, we are hopeful that we'll be able to be in a position where we'll brand the state of Oregon as the place, the home for track and field. The U.S. Olympic team trials will be here in 2016, which will be a record. This will be the, this will be the third consecutive time that the U.S. Olympic team trials will be held in this community on historic Hayward Field. It's pretty exciting to us, but the bigger vision and the biggest of all, and you'll hear it today, is the city of Eugene has put forward a bid to host the 2019 IAAF Outdoor Championships. Now let me talk a little bit about the IAAF Championships. It's not just about, that's not just the World Juniors or the World Indoor Championships. This is the Olympic Games of the sport of track and field. This truly, truly will become, if we can win the bid against Doha and Barcelona, it will be the largest event held in the United States except for the Olympic Games. We expect about 32,000 people a day for eight straight days. So it would be phenomenal. Now, I must add that we are a long shot for this, uh, but it's down to three, and we will present that bid if we go forward in November of this year. So, you know, as much as we talk about all the great athletic stuff and all the partnerships between the academic communities, let's talk a little bit about economic impact. The economic impact to this community on just the annual events. If you were at the high school state meet two weeks ago, you saw record crowds, 9,000 and 10,000. The pre-classic, which had record number of crowds. This Eugene Marathons, the NCA, some of those other really good things that have happened. About $7 million in, 200, in 2014. But since 2005, all the events we've hosted in this community has created an economic impact of $107 million. As we go forward in 2000, from 2014 to 2016, another 99 million. So if you, if you put those together, well over 200 million of economic impact for the community. So it's a fantastic opportunity for us to leverage the sport of track and field. We have several ways that people have gotten involved in here, and I applaud the business communities because they've participated in our flag program. They bought the flags, of representing the different countries who will be participating at the World Junior Championships, and they're actually posting them either in their business or they're hoisting them in their lawn, which will show the kids when they arrive here, these are all athletes below the age of 20, and they will get to see what this community really is all about in representing uh, a global view and, and actually welcoming these kids. That's the flag program. 
tickets. Those are the things that this community can really do by selling out the World Junior Championship and this week's NCAAs. That's something that we're trying, we hopefully will be able to do. We are excited that we have over a thousand volunteers who have stepped forward, either as ushers or as people who help us in the competitive, in the competitive places, but we've had volunteers every year. The Olympic trials, we had volunteers from every state in the United States represented. We had over 2,000 volunteers. Fantastic, and all they had was a hat and a t-shirt. It was fantastic. A couple of lunches, too. Um, we have been able to, in this same room, we've put together these Track Town Tuesdays, which provides a, a good opportunity to share some of this information with the local community. So our hope is that Track Town USA continues to flourish and to be sure that we are not only just the not just Eugene, and Tracktown USA is not just a Eugene event, but it's a statewide, and we hope to, rep to be the model program for the West rest of the world to emulate. So I'm going to take just a few minutes here to turn this over to Michael, and he's going to talk a little bit about the more specific things. So I appreciate your energy, and I appreciate your time. I appreciate being invited here, and I guess I'm going to answer some questions here at the end. Thank you very much. <laughs> So you've just heard Vin describe a pretty powerful vision for Tracktown USA and for this community. A vision in which, together, this community and the entire state of Oregon is able to reap tremendous benefits by leveraging the special relationship that this Tracktown concept has to the rest of the world. We've done a good job, I think, in taking advantage of the opportunities provided by these major meets, not only to a national audience, but to an international audience as well. Quite simply, these events are a window through which the rest of the world has been able to see and learn about our community. Just a few numbers for you. In 2008, the Olympic trials were broadcast on NBC, and their broadcast numbers indicated that over 12 million people watched that track meet at Hayward Field. In 2012, the Olympic trials numbers jumped tremendously. NBC reported viewership over 25 million for that event. At the 2012 trials, the University of Oregon conducted a booth outside of the stadium. They had over 25,000 visitors over 10 days to the University of Oregon booth. Their marketing team ran a gold medal game that rewarded people for visiting 13 different locations on the University of Oregon campus, and they handed out over 10,000 rewards for individuals that visited all 13 locations on the University of Oregon. This summer's World Junior Championships and the IWF World Indoor Championships in 2016 will be broadcast internationally to over 160 countries. Quite honestly, these pro high profile events are a tremendous platform for putting our community in front of millions of people around this country and across the globe. People who otherwise might not be exposed to who we are and what makes us really very, very special. These events are also an opportunity to bring in people to our community that might otherwise not come here and might not otherwise connect. We're talking big CEOs and vice presidents of major national and international corporations. Big government officials, not only U.S. Senators, but the Prince of Monaco has been here to attend the U.S. Olympic trials. And I don't know what your personal opinions are on reality television, but in, I can guess them, I'm guessing. In 2012, we brought back, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the decathlon, we brought back all the great decathletes in the United States, one of whom, of course, and perhaps one of the greatest, was Bruce Jenner. You may also know him in his alternate universe as Keeping Up with the Kardashians. But because we brought Bruce Jenner here and we celebrated the decathletes, that network audience, that network crew brought the television crew here and filmed episodes of Keeping Up with the Kardashians because Bruce Jenner was being recognized here and so on. So we were able to get the University of Oregon, Hayward Field, the Jordan Schnitzer Museum in front of seven million television viewers simply because we brought Bruce Jenner back. Probably not our traditional audience, maybe not the attitude and the, uh, the way in which we want to be promoting ourselves on reality television, 
However, it was an opportunity, nonetheless, to expose our community to a different group of people. And those numbers are great, and they're really pretty powerful and pretty impactful. But, you know, a reasonable person certainly might ask the question, okay, we're seen around the United States, we're seen around the world, but is getting into those homes and getting in front of those people, are people really taking notice? Is that really, in fact, having an impact? And I'm here to tell you that the answer is a resounding yes. A couple of examples. Let's, let's talk volunteers. At the 2012 Olympic trials, we had almost 300 volunteers pay for their travel from 31 different states, pay to put themselves up here for the opportunity to volunteer for the event in our community. This summer for the World Junior Championships, we're not just talking states. We will have over 37 countries represented in our volunteer workforce. 25% of those volunteers will speak a second language other than English. 5% will speak three languages. We put online for all of our volunteers that have signed up a digital training manual. And I'm here to tell you that that manual has been viewed in Australia. It's been seen in Germany, the United Kingdom, Nigeria, Canada, China, France, and Poland. People that understand what it is to come here and be part of what we do with track and field at Hayward Field are flying internationally to want to volunteer and be part of that experience. And I think that's something really pretty spectacular. Let's talk social media. We created special accounts this summer on Facebook and Twitter for the World Junior Championships. Those accounts are filled with postings from athletes, with coaches, with teams from all over the world. And when an athlete qualifies to represent their country, we're one of the first ones to hear about it on social media and for them to express their excitement. But they're not just expressing their excitement for coming to compete and to represent their country in the, in the largest national, uh, international event at their age level. They're advocating and expressing their excitement for coming to compete at Hayward Field. And we think that that is something really pretty spectacular. And if you take a quick view through our Facebook page for the event, you will see more languages represented there. Our staff is doing a good job of go using Google Translate to understand the postings that are being made on our Facebook page. Let's talk traditional media. As was mentioned in the introduction, I was fortunate enough to spend a year uh, living in London working on the Olympic Games. And of course, the people back here in Tracktown were hosting the 2012 Olympic trials and I was following closely and I was screaming at my laptop for Ashton Eaton to set the world record uh, in the decathlon. And of course, he did. And of course, because Team USA is the world's number one track and field team, and because the sport of track and field really takes center stage at the Olympic Games, the London media really did a great job of covering what was taking place here. And a couple of days after Ashton set his world record, I arrived at my desk uh, in Canary Wharf and somebody had placed a copy of the London Times on my desk and in the London Times there was a two-page spread talking about the Olympic trials in Hayward Field. But the interesting part was that the world record that Ashton Eaton said was not the lead of the story. The journalist chose instead to focus on the community that created that performance. The article was about the rhythmic clapping in the grandstands, the knowledge of the fans in the grandstands, the number of people that made their journey up to Pree's Rock or would start their day by running on Pree's Trail, and certainly about the warmth of the people in this town. They took two pages out of the London Times to tell that story, not the story about the athletic performances. And I think that's the impact that we're having internationally. And certainly, and finally, if we can use the adage that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery as one benchmark, we're clearly onto something here. This past March, the city of Edmonton, Alberta, announced that it would host the 2015 and in 2016 Canadian Track and Field Championships. They had already been awarded the 2015 Pan American Junior Track and Field Championships, which would bring together all the Pan American countries for a competition. Now, the key. Uh, information isn't the fact that Edmonton chose to make a big announcement about winning those events or the fact that they in fact won them. The truly telling element in the story is that in making their announcement, 
Edmonton seized upon the moment to declare itself Tracktown Canada. <laughs> I'd like to quote the mayor of Edmonton. The declaration of Edmonton as Tracktown Canada clearly demonstrates our commitment to continuing to advance athletes and confirms our city as a center of athletics. How telling is it that Edmonton, the capital city of Alberta, and a city that hosted the 2001 World Track and Field Championships, chose our community as a model for its strategic initiatives, that it chose our community as the basis for rebranding itself. Now, maybe in the fall you can invite Vin and I back and we can have a good academic discussion about what happens to the value of your brand when somebody else comes in and kind of co-ops it and steals it and makes it uh, its own. And I think there's value in having that discussion. But I think the message is really clear. We have something special and we have something that other cities want. But what is it exactly that we have? Athletic success. We know we have athletic success in this community. Think about the University of Oregon just as one example. 24 NCAA titles between the men and the women. And as Vin mentioned, poised for two more next week. UO athletes have set 22 world records. We've uh, birthed 85 Olympians. We have the Oregon Track Club elite that lives in our communities. Their roster includes Olympic champion and world record holder Ashton Eaton, world championship silver medalist, his wife, Brianne, Olympic silver medalist, Sally Kipiego, world champion, Jesse Williams. Athletes that live and train in our community are amongst the best in the world. Hayward Field has seen more sub four minute miles than any stadium in the world. The shot putters have thrown over 70 feet at Hayward Field more than any other venue in the world. Really spectacular performances. But it's not really the athletic performances that distinguish our community. What distinguishes us is the way in which the sport is woven into the fabric of our community. And that all really started, of course, with Bill Bowerman. We all love to win and we all love to see great athletic performance. But it was really his role as a professor of competitive response that transformed the community. He built a passionate and knowledgeable fan base. He convinced the faculty to officiate, to volunteer. He convinced local business owners to engage with what was going on. Last year we celebrated the 50th anniversary of that little jogging class that he started that might have kind of started a running movement nationally, internationally, all started right here in this community. And the attitude towards healthy living and healthy lifestyles certainly is an attractive quality that brings people into our community today. And so every day in Track Town we try to build upon that foundation. We try to keep that culture of innovation thriving. And whether it's establishing creative ways to engage boys and girls in being active, or whether it's finding creative ways to showcase the sport to a new audience, or more, more concretely, as Vin described, it's establishing a global standard for hosting multi-day sporting events in a sustainable fashion. We are in a position to show other communities, other organizations, how it can be done, how, things we, do, how we do things in Tracktown, USA. Thank you. We'll, we'll take a short break now for folks to formulate their questions and be back in about five minutes. Of Tracktown USA, on June 6th, our guest speakers are Vin Lanana and Michael Riley, and we have questions from the audience now. Well, thank you very much for being here. I'm Merlin Huff, a City Club member for uh, several years now. And, uh, uh, first, a comment on the Evergreen aspirations. Congratulations, and it's nice to see that Evergreen is actually placed above gold where, uh, where uh, you've already achieved. So uh, that's, uh, that's exciting, and good luck on, on that challenge. Uh, these long-term commitments are, are very exciting. This concept of going out 2035 like baseball, softball, uh, it's always been impressive just to see a couple Olympic trial commitments in a row and then to see something that long. But, uh, related to that, what's, what does it require to make a case for that long of a uh, commitment and what benefits are there to uh, the community and to the planning and preparations for, for those events? Well, the, the commitment that we, we would need to make for the long-term NCAAs is to do some serious renovations of the Hayward Field. 
uh, part of the Oklahoma City uh, hosting the NCAA World Series, College World Series in softball, is they're required to put $23 million into the facility for new restrooms, uh, for concessions, for flow around the facility, etc. And if they do those, then the NCAA will actually consummate the deal. So that would be one of the real strong considerations. In terms of the crowd, the community, the connection between the athletes and the fans, this place is unlike any place else. So we already have that. The student athlete experience, every young man or young woman from the moment they enter college will think about going to Hayward Field for that culminating experience. What are the benefits of the community? The benefits for the community, if this were to actually end up happening, every single hotel, all the restaurants, all the people coming here on an annual basis because the sustainable model for this to flourish is the fact that we need to be sure that people from around the country can mark this on their calendar and know this is a destination. Not just one championship and we're not just a host, but we're partners with the NCAAs long term. Oh, Ruth Demler, City Club member. Obesity and lots of growing health problems with our kids in schools. And uh, I have a grandchild in school here. And I was wondering what you're doing with connecting uh, your work here at the university and in Tracktown with the schools that we have here locally. Are you having members going out to the schools and encouraging them to have better track and maybe after school activities? or And are you encouraging them to come to some of the big events? Yes, uh, I can speak to three initiatives um, the, just this spring uh, that we're undertaking. Uh, the first of which we launched in the winter that we uh, dubbed the Tracktown USA Youth Challenge. Uh, we challenged um, boys and girls uh, around the community that if they went out and ran one mile, uh, we would provide to them and one parent a ticket to the World Junior Championships oh, this summer. Okay. And we targeted a mile because we felt like regardless of your body type, regardless of what sports you do, that that was an obtainable uh, goal. We uh, advertised, we did it, um, we made the announcement with uh, 200 days to go until the World Junior Championships. So we offered that we were going to provide this to uh, 200 boys and girls. Uh, we received 1,200 applications uh, for that, and we will honor uh, all of those commitments. So clearly it was a successful program. Uh, this spring, the Oregon Track Club Elite, uh, the athletes in the Oregon Track Club Elite went into uh, schools in the community and worked directly with them, providing some assistance and some uh, additional support to the physical education uh, programs in the elementary schools. And then just next week, if you come out on Thursday to the NCAA championships, uh, you will see almost 1,000 uh, boys and girls in the stands. Uh, a donor stepped up, provided the opportunity for 1,000 wow. boys and girls to come to the NCAA championships. Uh, they will be part of our Olympic Day experience where Olympians from the state of Oregon, professional track and field athletes from around the United States will do a presentation to them in Matthew Knight Arena. They'll talk about healthy living, positive life skills, and then they'll come out and get a chance to experience the NCAAs. Sounds great, but I'd love to see even more activities with the schools really coming out and seeking athletes to visit and so on. Uh, I had another question too. I had a great thrill the other night at Prefontaine when I saw Galen Rupp run. I'm a big track fan. And that was just amazing. And I'm sorry for all those people who didn't see it because it was just the most amaz amazing event I've ever seen at a track. And I've seen track all my life. Um, and I was wondering what are your, has been your special event that you've seen in track from both of you that you find just hard to ever forget. Who wants to go first? I'll go first. <laughs> I think that there, there, there are two things that come to mind. Before last Friday, uh, when I saw Galen Rupp on 2644, which I never thought I'd ever see an American run 2644, it's pretty impressive. Actually, I've never seen it. Since it's the American record, I didn't see it beforehand. But I would say that that was pretty impressive, but 
in the more recent ones, there are two. One is Ashton Eaton breaking the world record. And the vision that I have is in the pouring down rain on the, on the first day when Ashton was sitting on the blocks, the lane line, and he was sitting on the uh, lane marker, and the rain was pouring down so hard, and everybody was looking at, well, I guess it would be tough for him to really perform at his best. And he PR'd in the 100, he PR'd in the long jump, then he came back and had to run 413 for the 1500 to set the world record with the, all the previous Olympic gold medalists in the stands. For me, that was it. Uh, I would echo those. I'd add a couple more. I think um, in 2008 Olympic trials, when uh, the Eugene runners in the men's 800 went first, second, and third and made the Olympic team, that was pretty special. I think at the 2010 NCAA championships, when the Ducks went first, second, and third in the 1500 meters, and one that really stands out for me was also from the 2010 NCAA championships with the women's 4x400 meter relay with Keisha Baker on the anchor leg, holding off Texas A&M all the way around the last leg, off the final turn, leaning at the line to win. I was on the infield as the competition director for the event. I had an earpiece on the radio. The upstairs booth was barking in my ear, giving me these instructions, and it was so loud in Hayward Field, I could not hear the earpiece of the instructions that were being given to me. And I, I, if we were here longer, we could go down a whole other litany of other ones. Robin Fletcher, and uh, our table was wondering, with these big athletic events happening in the summer in Eugene, we were wondering about air quality and if you do anything <clears throat> to work with the county or with local farmers to prevent excess field burning, slash burning, things like that. We can't do anything about forest fires, but the things that are preventable. Well, I'll just I'll take one, one crack at it and then actually uh, bounce it back to Michael. And that is in 2008, if uh, you remember that, remember that time, it was a really hot week. And um, it was tough, and there were, the, there were the fires. And it was really, really difficult for the athletes. But prior, you know, and that was nothing we, can do, we could do about that. Fortunately, the winds uh, were blowing the right direction, so it wasn't that bad. But it was... It was tough, but prior to the 2008 Olympic team trials, we had, uh, we had spoken to the various organizations that can help us to control the field burning, and they were, they were just fantastically cooperative and did not do it during the Olympic trials. Yeah, I think one of the strengths of, of having these uh, events is the integration between the organizing committee and all the different uh, government agencies uh, at all levels, whether it's the city level, the county level, or the state level, and just bringing in all the people to be aware of hosting the events and getting everybody to think kind of globally about what's important to make sure everybody has the best experience. And we've been very fortunate in that we've been very fortunate in that we've had we've had tremendous cooperation from the city of Eugene, the city of Springfield, Ra uh, Lane County, and the state and in helping us to undertake this. There's a tremendous interest in this thing we sometimes take for granted, track and field. Hey, Deborah Healy, City Club member. I was in all of our table and everybody here in the room, I'm sure was very impressed with the success that you've had, the upstanding quality of the, the people who are running. And we we're wondering if there are some, if there's some guidance you could give to creating that kind of responsible, well-behaving um, athlete in other areas of the UO athletics program? Well, I'll probably speak to that since I work at the University of Oregon. Um, I think that from the, from the president's office down, there is always the emphasis on being good community members. Uh, and often when you're dealing with young men and young women that are between the age of 18 and 22, if any of you have children, you know that sometimes they don't always make the right decisions the same at the right time. And I, but I can tell you from a proactive perspective that all of the various organizations and all of our leaders have emphasized that on every, at every, every junction that they possibly can. Um, I think the sport of track and field it tends to be a 
unique sport because it is often driven by individual performances and and uh, so much of their performances are dependent upon physical preparation so therefore they really do spend the attention on sleep and eating and all of those things because they directly affect their athletic performances. Nancy Rose, City Club. I appreciate, appreciate everything that Tracktown USA is doing for Eugene and what they're doing for businesses and young people as well and for the spirit of the community and to let people know who we are and what nice people we are. However, the question that I have and that this comes from two smaller tables is this has to be fairly costly for the city of Eugene. Uh, to just monitor these events and so forth. And I know that the hotels take in taxes and I know businesses are making money, but for average people who aren't involved in some of those things who may be retired, how does this all get paid for? And how is, are these other people benefiting? Okay. I think the, the events all have different uh, funding models. So for example, the, uh, the NCAA championships are, are funded uh, by the NCAA, the ticket revenue generated from those events goes to offset the amount of money that the NCAA uh, contributes. Um, I think we've done a good job for the NCAA championships of doing some fundraising to raise additional funds to do some great strategic initiatives to really make the NCAA championships uh, be uh, something bigger and better than they are at any other institution. Uh, for the Olympic trials, we're fortunate to get funding support from lots of different uh, locations. It's overwhelmingly ticket revenue and sponsorship partnerships that um, derive the operating budget for the Olympic trials. But of course, for anything of this significance and that size, uh, we do need good uh, public sector support uh, for that. And we've been fortunate to be able to uh, tap into uh, room tax and various other uh, sources of revenue that um, are being generated by the event for some of that funding. And when we considered that in 2008 and we, when we considered it very, very strongly, we looked at the number of people who, who, were, who had accessibility to the event due to ticket prices, etc. That's why we created that festival, the Fan Festival, which was the best seat, not in the house. But it was a great, well-attended, six to 7,000 people per day. We replicated it in 2012. We expect to do something even more uh, even more grandiose and free in 2016. Matt Dodd, City Club member. Um, our questions are about facilities, and you touched on this, Vin, in the first question. Are there any planned upgrades or expansions to Hayward, and do you see an indoor facility coming down the road? I think that the, uh, the, the necessary piece for us to go forward with the 2019 bid is to have major renovations at Hayward Field. Um, and that is that the, we need to be able to handle the capacity, but not only the capacity, but the, but the concessions and all of the other amenities that go along with having a big sporting event in a place like Hayward Field. Although the intimate environment and the great fan support and the desirability of competing at Hayward Field, I think we have to look at the realities of things, and that is that it's also a facility that is long overdue for a facelift, and uh, we do need to address those things. So we will be, when we do have in, in play, uh, plans to do that. In terms of the indoor facility, that will be all part of a major renovation, and we hope to be able to undertake it shortly. But that, those decisions are made by uh, availability of space and money. Joe Koswick. Question about rain. Do you delay uh, any events if there's a cloud burst or put off the event uh, so the rain passes over? Or, and how does that affect, if you have to run in the rain, how does that affect performance? Well, I, I can certainly speak to at least the meat management uh, side of things. Um, Rain obviously comes into, comes into play mostly when you're considering the safety of the athletes out there. There are certainly some events, for example, the pole vault, that have um, much more at risk when the rain comes in. If you're talking about the 10,000 meters, while it's, yes, unpleasant and perhaps uncomfortable, uh, probably less of a safety risk uh, there. So from a meat management perspective, it's really the safety that will dictate 
uh, those things. I think Vin's experience as one of the world's best coaches, he could probably speak better to the performance side of those things. Yeah, you know, you, I think that if you live in Eugene and you host these big events, you can anticipate the possibility of rain. Although we've we have take we've hedged our bet a little bit from the 22nd of July to the 27th that it'll be a perfectly clear blue skies. <laughs> uh, Jerry Dean Helm, City Club member. Uh, this is a, a little tag to the question about an indoor facility. Uh, there's been some talk for some time of the need for an indoor facility and whether or not that's possible at Hayward Field or not. And uh, one of the things that's come up as a possibility is the use of Civic Stadium. I'm just wondering if there's anything new uh, that uh, we could hear about the relationship between an indoor facility and per perhaps the uh, use of our Civic Stadium. Well, we've had multiple conversations about Civic Stadium as a potential site for an indoor facility. Uh, the issue comes down to the ability to be able to afford to do that off campus. Uh, the most logical place for any kind of athletic facility that will be used by the University of Oregon is to be on the University of Oregon campus. So that creates one of the obstacles. The other obstacle is the ability to be able to pay for something off of the University of Oregon campus, which makes it a little complicated. In terms of a venue, and in terms of a place, and a site with its proximity to South Eugene High School and the Amazon Trail, it certainly makes a lot of sense to, to look at that as a possibility. But no, there's been no progress on it. Yeah, this is uh, Frank Carlton. Uh, just a, a quick question. It seems to me there was a distance runner a lady from Dartmouth who came to Oregon. Was it, and I'm not good with names, was it Abby D'Agostino or something like that? Have you got a report on what she's doing? Well, the athlete who, who you're referring to is Alexi Pappas. Okay. Uh, I wish Abby D'Agostino was at the University of Oregon. She's still at Dartmouth and will probably win the NCAAs at 5,000 meters next week. Okay. Uh, but Alexi Pappas is, she, she was a top performer in the steeplechase, and uh, she, will be compete, she competes for the Oregon Track Club Elite, so she lives here in Eugene. Great. Thank you. So I have a coach question. Um, it must have been 2008. My, my nephew came from the wilds of Cape Girardeau, and you gave him a few words as we stood by the track. He was a mad runner, uh, and he really, really wanted to be on the best team. Um, didn't quite get there. But, but for kids who, whose resources, whose personal resources, in fact, do not stretch to getting the best coaching where they are or having the right shoes or whatever. I mean, it seems to me as a parent, it was always about figuring out how you could afford the accoutrements for the sport. What kind of advice do you have for kids from the wilds of Cape Girardeau and like that? Um, how, do you, how do you, if you have a gift, and in his case, he had the gumption, he really had the grit, what, what, do you, what can you tell him about, about aiming high? I mean, all of the, at the University of Oregon, we're fortunate in that we do have a, a wide array of kids who dream about running for the University of Oregon. And some of that is Hayward Field, some of it is the Prefontaine mystique. So they do aspire to do that. What we try to do is help every time that we, we don't just recruit and say, no, you're not good enough. What we do is we actually try to make recommendations of what kinds of places would make sense depending upon their town skill and what it is that they're trying to achieve. So from the NCAA perspective, this, the fortunate thing is I've been at all great academic institutions and able to see that there are, there are those that can participate at the high level in Division I, but there's Division II and there's Division III, and there's opportunities for kids that are more participatory than they are trying to achieve NCAA championships. But we do go through great painstaking process to be able to provide uh, insight to them and recommendations for them. Dan Bryant, City Club member since 96. I totally get why uh, being track town uh, is such a good thing for Eugene um, with all these events. I want to turn it around. Why is it a good thing for the sport? It would seem like it'd be better for the sport if we spread the wealth, so to speak. So why is this good for the sport? Well, I think uh, internally, 
we don't really view uh, this notion of Tracktown USA as referring to a specific uh, geographic location. I know that it has that, that origin, uh, but we prefer to think of it um, more along the lines of uh, perhaps like people think of themselves as a member of the Red Sox nation. You don't necessarily have to be in Boston to be a passionate fan of the Boston Red Sox. You could be in Los Angeles, but you're devoted to what's happening there. You're devoted to what uh, is important and what those principles are. And, and we feel like what we do here in this community, whether it's with the OTC All Comers Meets in the summer, whether it's with the great participation for boys and girls in the Hershey Meets uh, in the spring, uh, whether it's great meets, whether it's a, a professional athletes training, we feel like that's the model that is transportable uh, to other cities. And we, uh, we know now that uh, because of the work in 2008 and 2012, there's already four candidate cities for the 2020 uh, Olympic trials around uh, the United States. Seven years in advance, people have already started trying to win uh, and work on that bid. So for us, we think that is what makes this notion of what we're doing in this community uh, portable. It's certainly much more than how many hotel rooms you have, what does your bus system look like, how big is your airport, uh, and so on. In our mind, it's a year-round commitment uh, to running into the sport of track and field at all levels, boys and girls, all the way up through masters. And if we can be successful in getting more communities uh, to behave like that, to adopt that thinking, then that's clearly good for the sport of track and field anywhere in the world. And I think evidence of that, it'll be seen this, uh, this next week with the NCAA championships. There will, there has, we'll have four hours of coverage on ESPN3, four hours of coverage on ESPN3 for Wednesday and Thursday, and then live coverage on Friday and Saturday. The NCAA has realized that of its 89 championships that they have in every single sport, that this track and field piece can be exciting and it can be something which is compelling. And I think the show that's put on by the Ducks next week, if you want to, being in the stadium is going to be the best experience that one can have. And I think as we go back and if we can create that kind of image for the sport of track and field, and right now this is the place to get it done. Thank you for bringing clarity and vision to the City Club program, The Future of Tracktown USA. And thanks again to our sponsors, Sacred Earth Botanicals, Marilyn Milne uh, Public Relations Services, and KLCC Radio. We meet again next Friday, June 13th, at the Downtown Athletic Club to hear the annual Turtle Award Awards and some Oregon history. Lunches for this program can be ordered on the City Club's website or by contacting the office. Thank you very much.